Welcome to our special event today in honor of National Autism Awareness Month, an afternoon of comedy with Asperger's or Us. I'm Susan Daniels, Director of the Office of Autism Research Coordination at the National Institute of Mental Health, which is one of the components of the National Institutes of Health. Our office manages the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, which is a federal advisory committee composed of federal officials and public stakeholders that provides advice collectively to the Secretary of Health and Human Services on issues related to autism. Our office also hosts workshops and special events like this one on behalf of the IACC and on behalf of the NIH. Today's event is an opportunity for us to recognize the important role that individuals on the autism spectrum play in our lives and in our communities, and to express our support for greater understanding, acceptance, inclusion, and empowerment of people on the autism spectrum. We also affirm our commitment to supporting the needs of the autism community. Later this month, on April 28th, we will be hosting a second special event focused on the response of federal agencies to the needs of the autism community during the coronavirus pandemic. Details about that event will be shared at the end of this event. I'm happy to extend a special welcome today to our honored guests, Noah Britton, a former member of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. Welcome, Noah. Ethan Finland, Finland, New Michael Injimi, and Jack Hankey, the comedians from Asperger's R Us. Asperger's R Us is the first comedy troupe composed of people diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. They've performed over 150 original sketch shows in 10 countries since 2010. They have also been featured in an HBO docuseries and one Netflix documentary. We are going to be having a discussion with the troupe on their experience as comedians on the autism spectrum and as members of the autism community. We had originally scheduled this event to take place last year in person, but we had to cancel due to the coronavirus pandemic. But we're pleased today to be able to bring this to you by, via a virtual platform. Before we talk with Asperger's or Us, I'd like to share how members of our viewing audience can participate. We have a live feedback link on the NIH video webcast page, which you can see below where the red is circled, that's the video cast um, live feedback link. You can click that link to send questions that you would like to see addressed in the audience Q&A. And I'll be reading some of those questions. We won't have time to cover all of them, but we will select a few to ask the group after we're done with the interview. And you can use that link to also send us messages if you're having technical difficulties and you'll get some assistance. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shelley Avenevoli, the Deputy Director of the National Institute of Mental Health, to share a special greeting on behalf of NIMH. Shelley? Thanks so much, Susan. Each year, we enjoy this opportunity during National Autism Awareness Month to recognize the contributions of individuals on the autism spectrum and their families and to support their full inclusion in all aspects of community life. The National Institute of Mental Health and its sister institutes at the National Institutes of Health are strongly committed to supporting research on autism, along with a wide variety of physical health, mental health, and behavioral health conditions and developmental disabilities. Through research, the NIH and the NIMH aim to improve our understanding of autism and contribute to efforts to improve the quality of life for individuals on the autism spectrum and their families. Thank you so much to our special guests for being with us today. I'm very much looking forward to this hour and a half time with you. Um, we're looking forward to hearing more about your experiences as, and your work. And Susan, back to you. Thank you so much. So to start, I'd like to show a clip from the trailer of the recent HBO docu-series on tour with Asperger's or Us. And this will be followed by a couple of clips from comedy routines by Asperger's or Us. Amazing. You might sell out. Guys, let's make this our best show ever. It's true, we're Asperger's or Us, the first comedy troupe of people with Asperger's syndrome. So if we're not funny, blame it on Ethan's disability. We'll tour the country trying to be funny for all the Aspies and their friends. We'll get famous, thanks Mark Duplass. We are going to do our first summer tour all the way from the Northeast to LA. We're so happy we got to be doing comedy all day. Sorry we sold out again. Yeah. Oh. Go! I think it's something we're still trying to figure out. Just how niche are we? Just how mainstream are we? We definitely can't do anything we haven't rehearsed. I think this is a bad idea. Uh-oh. 
Every minute of every day is a new bad surprise. So my daughter is eight. She just got diagnosed with Asperger's. Oh, congrats to her. <laughs> I'm feeling more and more strongly that I want to pursue comedy full time. It really is about the best life I could imagine. This is going to be fun. Or worst case, it won't. <laughs> Hey, hey, you know with your haircut that way, you look a lot like Ollie Dink Johnson. <laughs> yeah, I do, and just like him, I was born October 28th, 1892, in Biloxi, Mississippi, and was a Dixieland jazz pianist, clarinetist, and drummer. Background, I was born in Biloxi, Mississippi, one, younger brother of the bass player slash band leader, William Manuel Johnson. I worked around Mississippi and New Orleans, Louisiana before moving to the western United States in the early 1910s. I played around Nevada and California, often with my brother Bill. Most prominently, I played with the original Creole Orchestra, mostly on drums. For many years, I was based in Los Angeles, California, where I led a band in the 1920s and later ran a bar. Edit. Recordings. I made my first recordings in 1922 on clarinet with Kid Ory's band. I made more recordings in the 1940s and 1950s, mostly on piano, although doing some one-man band recordings, playing all three of my instruments through overdubbing. Edit. Music. My piano style was influenced by, by Jelly Mol Roll Morton, who was my brother-in-law, and my clarinet playing was influenced by Larry Shields. I also wrote tunes, including the Crooked Blues, recorded by King Oliver, and so different blues. Edit. Death. I died in Portland, Oregon, on November 29, 1954. Wow, you really do have a lot in common with him. So we're so excited to have you all here and looking forward to talking with you. So now, Asperger's Rutz, can you please introduce yourselves? Hello. <laughs> I think that was a perfect introduction. Next question. <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead, Ethan. So tell us a little bit about yourself and each of you. No, I do not appreciate these kind of loaded questions. You did not prepare us for an ambush interview. Yeah. Can you can you throw us a few softballs first, just so we can sort of get warmed up? I don't. <laughs> want to I know this is already starting out a little rough. But if well, if probably. she throws softballs, my computer will break. So make sure you have really good aim. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, anyway, my name is Asperger's R Us, and uh, I'm a I'm a comedy troupe. Asperger's R Us. <laughs> Oh, we're 11. Thanks, Asperger's or us. Great. You're welcome. So, where do you all live? What do you do besides where? comedy, or is comedy your full time job? And tell us anything else you want to tell us about yourselves before we get started. Oh, I'm a. New Michael, I think, has been replaced by extremely old Michael uh, today. But uh, extremely old Michael, make sure you're audible. It's hard to hear hear you saying that you're a steel worker. Uh, I'm Noah Britton. I'm a psych professor and a life coach for uh, adults on the autism spectrum. And I also co-lead a support group. But um, 
right now my main gig is comedy because we're doing a comedy show at this moment so it's my full time 100 percent of my attention is dedicated to what we're doing right now but in an hour i'll go back to being unemployed and then an hour later i'll, I'll lead my support group full time my, uh, my name is jack pinky i'm uh, also a full-time comedian during this show but um outside of the show i am an aspiring um human trafficking researcher, or um, at least someone who works, who works in the um, human trafficking or anti-human trafficking field. I'm on the anti-axis when it comes to slavery opinions. Jack inadvertently made that joke, so I don't have to. Mm. We said no controversial stuff, Jack. Right. <laughs> uh, Ethan, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Ethan Finland, not Ethan. Sorry, I'm a uh, freelance writer and a transportation advocate in the Boston area. Uh, pr presently a full time comedian, but only for now. Yeah, he's on the anti side of transportation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I oppose it. Don't we all? This work from home stuff is great. Well, excellent. Well, that's, those are some great introductions. So, all right. So, I'll throw you my first softball question. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your experience as a young person growing up on the spectrum and what were some of the significant or formative experiences that led you to where you are today? I remember is pure darkness and warmth. And then I was expelled out into a very cold, bright area. And I began crying and a man in doctor scrubs smacked me on the butt. And um, a woman who I later came to know as my mom, uh, held me and um i don't really remember much after that do you guys have anything i think i think that that's when um that's when ethan and michael and i found him yeah. abandoned in the hospital and uh, we took him home and cared for him and uh and, and that's when we found that uh that rusty old pair of scissors were used to finally separate him from the mother yeah mm -hmm. that was you guys wow. yeah, yeah. Was, i owe you even fun. more than i knew that was um, I think the, uh, <laughs> what was that? And eventually Ethan had to use his teeth. I still have scars. That's how you eat. That's pretty rough. <laughs> uh, I don't know what, what do we want to say about being in the troupe? It's more fun than, uh, not being in a comedy troupe. That's more fun than, uh, years and years the sawmill. <laughs> well, I think this is more about our, our formative experiences before becoming a comedy. Yeah. Is that is that right? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. Did you discover that you were funny right right out of the womb? Were you comedian from the very beginning? When did you first think that you were interested in comedy? Wait, is she saying we're funny? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> what, Jack? You broke up. I, uh, stop bringing up my breakups. Um, <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> I forget what I was going to say, but and I guess to answer the question seriously, I realized I was, I don't think I realized I was funny until like eight, 10, 11 or so at summer camp. Not the one where I, um, not the one where I met these guys, a different summer camp. Um, and I don't know. Even more self esteem it's always terrible. I think I realized pretty early on. me a while to figure out you know, this is something I can use to make friends. Um, that, uh, uh, you know, funny thing that ever happened to me. In 1972 at the sawmill, this is when I realized I was funny. I said, uh, I said, hey, Frankie Giuliani, hey, don't you dare put your finger where that saw goes. And he did anyway. He thought I was joking. And the finger came off. That was the funny thing that ever happened at the sawmill. I gotta go to comedy after that. Wait, was that the funniest thing that happened to you or to the song? I would think both, right? I mean, how could anything pass that? They didn't have cameras there in those days, you know, for the better, pretty much. But uh, <laughs> for the worst, because we'll go crazy. We'll do the runs on YouTube and stand down on film. I think. So, well, with your group, like, did you, how did you form and. When did you become Asperger's or us? Uh, the first years ago, um, a number of atoms coalesced uh, into uh, a, a sort of 
um, nascent planetoid orbiting. None of us is named Adam, Jack. Come on. Right. I got confused. I'm thinking of something else. Uh, that joke think. was funny on like a molecular level, but like let's let's stick to the 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 real answer. <clears throat> so I don't know the answer. So why don't you? Why do you? I don't know. Well, as Jack said, yeah, it's, it's okay. That's the most times. Um, it's been a, several years, you know. But um, it is right. Exactly. Yeah, we we like Jack said, we met at a summer camp, um, and then we decided well we all made each other laugh and laugh and seemed to make other people laugh so we decided to um, start doing comedy shows that was almost 11 years ago now um mm -hmm. and since then we oh. ended up touring the world in 2017 um uh, yeah it's been well a ride. we I'm met we like met summer camp am i right <laughs> <laughs> we met that's our funniest joke <laughs> too soon we met in 2005 at at camp and uh it was a aspie camp for learning improv and acting but i ran my group more like a comedy group because uh it was more instantly gratifying and uh i'm not a very good actor so i can't really teach it but uh these guys were some of the funniest people and uh that was why i was like let's let's do this elsewhere because Every day, I would just be like exhausted from laughing so much uh, from these guys being so funny. And uh, no, the camp doesn't exist anymore. To all of you wondering about uh, whether you can go there, sadly, but it was really important to to us when we were young. I will do the great goggles fire. I I want to I want to um, explain one thing about the. Um, the sketches that you just watched. Uh, I don't know if it was clear that in the, um, you know who you look like sketch, uh, Ethan's just reading the Wikipedia for this guy named Ollie Dink Johnson. But um, the reason we picked Ollie Dink Johnson as being similar to Ethan is that he was born exactly 100 years uh, earlier than Ethan. And so we were like, this is perfect. He has the same birthday, let's, let's make him the, uh, the guy that he looks like, even though they did not ever look anything alike. Well, the, no. probably. I mean, I guess now they do. Because uh, well, well, Jelly Roll one. Yeah. Um, and the other one uh, at the end of the celery sketch, Jack hands uh, the celery wrapped up in wrapping paper to someone in the crowd who we did not know, and some of them kept it, which I thought was kind of weird. <laughs> Sorry, Susan, That's what you? was your question? <laughs> so I guess I didn't get a chance to get any celery from you. Maybe maybe <laughs> in a few. We would have definitely done it live at this show. And next time we'll remember, Jack, give it to Susan. If you want to drive up here. Oh. You know, <laughs> no. I'm happy to do You can clone us from it because it has both of our saliva on there. You work at NIH. What? They've perfected cloning by now, right? They're, they're working on it, I think. Oh, I don't really so follow that's the great. news. That's healthy that you hand out. What are my tax dollars going to if not cloning me from a half-eaten piece of celery? Well, so well, <laughs> that'll be a future opportunity, I guess, for <laughs> your your contribution to research. So, well, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in breaking into the world of comedy, um, especially as autistic professionals and being pioneers in the field? What what did you experience? Rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. I'm sorry, old, old Michael. <laughs> From working in the sawmill for so long. Rheumatoid arthritis. Hemorrhoids. <laughs> um... <laughs> Ah, my life too much. I think one thing that uh, I do want to mention sincerely, um, a lot of people don't know what to expect and assume a variety of things erroneously about us. And, you know, we're just here to be funny for people who like silly stuff and Aspie seem to like this style of humor it seems to come naturally to us um that really subtle stuff uh that jack is particularly good at 
And so sometimes we get people who are really expecting something other than that, and they leave disappointed or confused. They're like, I don't know what's going on, but good job, you know, patting us on the back for trying. But in reality, all the jokes are going over their heads. Oh, or, it's or it's just not their thing. It's like what, they, like what Cervantes says, you know, money's not worthy of the mouth of the ass. So I don't like it. No. Don Quixote. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read it yet. I will. I promise. No, but right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the uh, I guess that's that's been the biggest challenge is getting people to recognize we're very consciously aware of what we're doing that's silly, but it's subtle and it might pass people by. Like for example, right behind me is uh, my PhD. Um, which was handmade by a friend of mine. Uh, you can kind of see it there. Uh, it's handwritten PhD of uh, hamburgerology because McDonald's refused to give me an honorary doctorate. And so I had my friend hand make one. And this is the kind of thing where if you're not Asperger's or us, people would be like, that's really funny. You don't really have a doctorate from uh, McDonald's, but people might be like, oh, he thinks that's a real degree and he loves hamburgers or some ridiculous assumption that's completely unfair. And that's something we are uh, pretty tired of dealing with. Point and, is, you think forgery is funny at this point. <laughs> we do think forgery is funny. <laughs> I think forgery is very funny as long as it's pointless. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if I were using this for a job, it would not be funny. Did you start touring early on in your comedic career, or did that sort of happen later as you um, gained more, more um, fame and notoriety? Our first, our first gig outside of Massachusetts, where we all live and lived in 2012, was in Texas, I think in 2011 or 12. Right. And um, then uh, our first national tour was 2016 that you can see in our uh netflix movie um the uh first international tour which we booked entirely on our own was 2017 we went to europe and then uh we went back in 2019 and that was amazing um and uh who knows what the future holds Thank you. that's true what does it hold jack i always forget that you're psychic the what? Mostly cups. Cups? Okay. Well, at least we won't have a shortage of places to keep liquid in the future. It's like a better version of cup holders. It's like a what? Like a better version of cup holders. Cup holders? Okay, cool. Huh. I'm excited for the future for the first time. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> so what gives you the inspiration for your sketches? Nothing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We get them all from Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> there's this long uh, Wikipedia article called "Lift of Asperger's Arrest Sketches," and we write all of our sketches down, copy them down from there. <laughs> we put them on Wikipedia, then we go back and look, copy them down. Okay. We don't usually put them on there. Like, actually, do you know it? You guys know where they came from in the first place? I yeah, I've been writing them for years and just putting on them on Wikipedia. That's how I work it out together. What? You never told us this. I know you know you the name uh Asperger's Asses, Ryan Loses. These guys are horrible. It's a long username that I had to commit to the bit. I guys. Yeah, I am. I'm surprised you even do Wikipedia after uh, you know my daughter in law shows me how. Oh, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> How is she anyway? <laughs> uh, she's doing okay. She's, she's recovering from the fall. Uh, well, that happens every spring, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. We Have had a... Uh, sorry, go ahead, Susan. Oh, no. Um, I was just going to say, in your travels and doing shows around the country and around the world, have you felt like you've been able to connect with the autism community in different places? And what is that... Taught you, or what have you learned through doing that? 
No, it is not. <laughs> We've met hundreds of autistic people traveling, touring, and uh, some of them we get along with really well, and we love them, and they become lifelong friends, and it's great, and they're who we started Asperger's or Us for, uh, people who really understand our sense of humor. Um, and, uh, like, shout out to Eamon. Uh, we love you. We assume you're not watching because you live in England, but uh, we love you all the same. But, yeah, so that's been really nice. But, of course, you know, autism is so heterogeneous that plenty of autistic people in the crowd don't get it and aren't into our sense of humor. You know, they might like stuff that's more uh, observational than we like. And, you know, that's that's fine for them. But it's not the it's not the particular subset of autism that our comedy hits. Basically, to me, there are like two types of autism. The type that likes to wrestle in the mud and get a little dirty. And then the type that is into something else. <laughs> Which <laughs> one are we? Well, then maybe we can get along. The funny thing is, these two groups are about the same size. <laughs> well, then I guess the one who likes to wrestle probably wins. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what do you found rewarding about doing this work? Absolutely. Been... Mostly the money. Yeah, I was going to say. Cha ching. Uh, you, what, Ethan? You cut off. He dropped his trophy in the sawmill, even though it's been closed for 30 mm. That's what I told you. I actually told it for 30 seconds. This is, speaking of trophies, this is a trophy. I think I bought this one uh, in um, when we were on tour in Washington. But uh, I bought um, a second place and a third place medal from one of our favorite stores that we got to visit. And uh, I gave the third place medal to Mark Duplass, who made our movie and our TV show. And I gave the second place one to my girlfriend. And she got really mad that I gave her this that says number two in my heart. Uh, <laughs> and she gave it back to me because she was so insulted. But I was like, that's so funny. And everyone's like, why didn't you buy, well, who did you give the first place medal to? And I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to give myself a first place medal. That would just be arrogant and rude. I don't know what you want to do. I'll have the number one in your heart. I'll have the number two. <laughs> I would have number two. You need heart surgery if you get number two in your heart. You know, eating like these two guys did, you know. You know, two guys eating from the same salary. I'll get number two straight to your heart. <laughs> number one. So do you feel like being in on HBO and Netflix has changed your life in any way? What have been the changes that you've seen since you've probably gained more um, fame, you've been involved with more people through these series. It used to be that you'd turn on the TV and you wouldn't see us, but now you do. Now you turn on the TV and you don't see us. And now it's a little bit of awkwardness for people who don't understand us right? and still don't understand us after seeing the movie or the TV show. Mm. That's the answer. Apart from that, everything is the same. It's just like 1973 all over again. <laughs> you know, Ricky Giovanni still don't got his finger. <laughs> Iron Butterfly is still at the top of the charts. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Um, we we used to get recognized after the movie came out on Netflix. We got recognized on the street a little bit. And... Uh, it made me have a lot more sympathy for famous people because our popularity petered off and now we don't get recognized anymore. And so we can go to the store without somebody hassling us or, you know, wanting to pitch us something. And it made me really feel for famous, famous people who can never be alone for even a second uh, when they're outdoors. What about your orange hat? That's why I started wearing this orange hat. Nobody recognizes me. <laughs> but yeah, so that that was it was fun for a little bit, and I think my biggest regret is that we didn't come up with some 
planned thing to do every time somebody recognized us. It always caught us off guard. And I guess that's the difference is when you've been dealing with it for 40 years, like Bill Murray has, you're, you're prepared. But yeah, that was, that was the big change. And we got to tour Europe because of the movie, which we're really grateful for. So, well, in this whole process, have there been any role models or mentors that have helped you along the way or people that you look to for inspiration? I think you look up to our stalker a lot. I was looking up to this avatar up here at the top right of the computer. There's a couple of good looking boys. I think all of us uh, look up to Dave Britton a lot. Uh, my dad, who uh, inspired me to pursue comedy. I I grew up really loving and studying comedy. I, I wanted to be in a sketch troupe since I was 12. And uh, Kids in the Hall were a big part of that. So I was really grateful. Um, I uh, Oh, we have a question from the audience, which is neat. Uh, that says we're hilarious, so that's cool. Um, uh, asking, are you doing any virtual shows, and where can I find you? And clearly, this person does not know what you're watching because this is a virtual show, and you can find us right here. Live in the moment. How much money you got? <laughs> yeah, we will do a virtual show if you will pay us. That's a visit what Dave Britton taught us. He showed us the ropes. Right. <laughs> You know, pots and don't go and pick and fights after closing time, which is something some of us learn the hard way, is uh, well, how man. much money you got. If you want a show, how much money you got. <laughs> Beats working in the sawmill. You know, I think the sawmill. <laughs> what, what uh, Susan? Oh, I said the sawmill must be a hard life. So do you guys... Perfect. Mentor others in the comedy area, or do you do you work with other young people in this um, who are interested in getting into comedy? A little bit. We primarily work against young people, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is, like, if anybody else goes into comedy, it cuts down the amount of shows we can get. So our main goal, if anything, if you take one thing from us, do not go into comedy so that we can get all of the show offers. If and when we get too many to take, then we might say, you know, Stephen Wright can get back into comedy, but we want him to retire until we are making maybe two million dollars a year from this. We're hoping there's so few comedians out there that everybody will forget what comedy even is, <laughs> and then we'll show them, and they'll think we reason invented it, <laughs> then we'll get the Nobel Prize. Mm. She already Nobel mentioned Prize. us being pioneers. Nobel Prize in comedy, right? Oh, that's great. I'm sure they'll be nominated. It sounds like a gas. Mm. A little Nobel humor for you chemistry fans out there. Periodically, I'll, I'll just table the conversation and bring that in. It's sort of elemental to what right. we do. You should write your own column about that, that stuff. Yeah, should write my own what about that stuff? Write your own column about that stuff. Like column? Oh, nice. Okay. A yeah. little complicated periodic table pun. So how has your work together influenced your relationships with each other as you've grown together, working on comedy together? What has oh, that been like? We started out as friends, and we worked our way all the way up to colleagues. Mm-hmm. true? Yep. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, maybe when they let me pour all that sawdust down their lungs, too, we can talk about being friends again. <laughs> that doesn't sound worth it. Not yet. Yeah, working together is hard. Uh, when we were in Liverpool, we took a picture in front of a sign that said, um, no friendship can withstand the... Um, the brunt of close contact, some, I'm paraphrasing. And uh, I thought it was a funny thing to take a picture of while we were in tour, but it's true. I've been sitting close to these guys for the last 40 minutes or so, and I'm already disgusted. <laughs> you know, cuteness could overcome a lot of that stuff. And I find these guys, these young guys, real cute and precious. So no matter how much they may bother me, you know, they, 
and put this all comes all. That's my philosophy. That's what I've learned. Thank God. He mentioned we weren't. I mean, I think that definitely for you anyway, old, old Michael, the cuteness really overcomes your horrendous voice of, of sawdust. Are you I think it's very soothing. <laughs> Why I poured all this sawdust down his throat. Very soothing voice. Yeah, he has eight consecutive tracks of just him, uh, of this, uh, of just me, Michael, talking in that voice that he listens to every night to fall asleep. And you think I got the sawdust in my lungs from working in the mail? What are you, stupid? They insulted me? They had OSHA back then. I'm not that old. <laughs> How do you get the sawdust in your lungs then? He gave me open lung surgery. Put it straight in. And he didn't even measure it right. Did you get too much or too little? He, he measured by the gram. I don't care how much it was. You gotta use the right unit. In this country, we use the British system. <laughs> oh, uh, grandmother. Right. All right. What was your next question, Susan? <laughs> so, what have you been doing during the pandemic? Have you been able? What have we been dur doing during what? During the pandemic, have you been doing virtual shows, or what have you been doing in terms of your comedy, or just keeping yourself happy with your comedy well, as we all do this together? I think um, I may not be the best person to answer this, but. Maybe my good friend Hubert is the best person to answer this. Unfortunately, uh, so, you know, during the pandemic, you have a lot of spare time uh, where you don't have a lot to do. And so you're sitting there, you're bored. You're like, maybe I should take up a new hobby. Maybe I should, you know, learn a new skill. And um, I didn't do that. I haven't learned ventriloquism. Okay. So are you working ventriloquism? No. Nope. No? Hubert just sits there. He's a handsome guy, though. Cuteness makes up for a lot, just like old, old Michael said. Yeah, that's one of the dominating forces of this world. Money, cuteness, uh, Hubert, energy. Sawdust. Sawdust. So, now, is there anything else? you had wanted to talk about um, before we switch over to the audience questions. I, I also do want to know about your future plans, but anything that I didn't ask you that you'd love to answer? It's so important to stay positive. No matter what happens in life, it'll work out a thousand times better if you're positive, you've got a good attitude. You know, everybody's got problems. But uh, if you approach it with a positive attitude, it'll be better than if you approach it with a, you know, woe is me attitude. I think that sounds okay. I wouldn't say I agree totally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I uh, guess... The comedian here. One thing, I, I want to mention that um, uh, we have merch for sale. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with our work might be familiar with our shirt uh which you can get in uh black and white or white and black uh and um it's on our website aspergersrus.com we have uh all sizes and uh obviously when somebody asks you run away in fear only been worn hey. five times <laughs> Well, yeah, but like with lots of breaks in between. Well, the value of a shirt goes up the more you wear, the more it's been pre worn. So mm hmm. I call that vintage sweat. <laughs> and uh, yeah, AspergersRUs.com is not a um, unsafe website, despite what your browser says. It auto flags our host, uh, which is GeoCities.ws as a spam website, but we don't spam with it. It's just that other people who use geocities.ws do that. I see. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> we do have your web on the web page for this event, so people can find it there. Cool. So what are your future site? for your city group? What, Jack? Oh, sorry. To an unsafe site? It says it's an unsafe site, but it's not unsafe. It's safe. 
Well, that is unsafe. I don't know. I think we should report the uh, NIH. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The NIH there stole my data. Out there who know how to get online? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone here knows how to get online. Our future plans include learning how to use the internet for the first time. What are Sounds all these like keys go. for? Uh, I don't know. Well, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I, sorry. Is there anything else you wanted to say before? If we... anybody wants to book us to do a virtual show, we'll do it. You just got to pay us, email us uh, via our website. We are happy to That's respond. Pay us. Yeah, pay us virtually, and we will virtually perform. Interpret that pandemic, however you want. Before the pandemic, we were uh, we were um, we were trying to see if we could get someone to uh, hire us to come out to Australia, which is uh, one of the few English-speaking parts of the world um, that we haven't been yet. So, if anyone out here is from Australia and there's U.S. government um, uh, screen, um, love to have you. <laughs> right over there. Exactly. Will the U.S. government pay us to fly to Australia and do a show out there? That would be cool. I'd like to take a flight with a kangaroo. <laughs> Again? <laughs> I think the kangaroo probably has that one in the pocket. Mm. Okay, we'll take questions from the viewers now. Yeah, questions yeah, from the viewers. So I'm waiting to get some a couple of questions. Oh, do you have a question? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> I was this, is, this is a joke that Jack has done for approximately 10 years during all of our Q&As at the end of our shows. QIE, you know, adapted to become so cute. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be dead. And I already am in a second. Um, let me think what else we want to talk about. We want to send a shout out to all our favorite comedians, Joe Para, Jamie Loftus, uh, Eric Andre, uh, who else? Brent Weinbach. Uh, Andrew Carnegie. Who? Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie, although I was trying to go with living comedians, but that's, you know, he was pretty successful. I guess it extended to death. Um, who else do we love very much? What? He was so successful that he died. That's true. Um, Shout out to our least successful, uh, or our least favorite comedians. <laughs> yeah. So Jack uh, Hankey, Ethan out. Finland, Noah Britton. Yeah. What, Jack? Less of, a, less of a respectful shout, more of a threatening shout. Yep. Shout out to all four of our least favorite comedians, us. So here's a question. What advice would you give a young person on the spectrum who wants to get into comedy or show business? That's too, that's too generic. It depends on the person. No matter what advice you give, it really depends on the person. So I wouldn't give no advice to nobody unless I knew them personally. I would say it depends on how talented they are. I mean, if they're pretty talented and they might pose a threat to our, our corner of the market, I would say they should absolutely not uh, attempt to be a comedian because then we will get fewer shows. But if they're not very talented and they have no, and they're not very funny, I would say they should definitely try because it'll make us look better in comparison. Exactly. Yeah, that. that's why we got into this business to make Stephen Wright and Emo Phillips look better in comparison. Um, no, I I actually do want to mention since we don't have a ton of questions, so I want to mention some sincere advice to uh, autistic people, because we haven't gotten into any of that, and I bet some of the viewers do want to know. Um, if you're interested in comedy or performing, or you know, people have told you you're very creative. Um, They're lying. It's possible. I was trying to figure out how to word that, but it is possible. I think it's important to pay attention to feedback you receive from people who seem to uh, be saying the same thing. So I forget who said this, but if you hear the same piece of feedback from multiple people, consider the fact that it might be true. And don't uh, decide that just because you like what you're doing that it's automatically good. It took me a while to figure that out. Not to say that you shouldn't have your own standards, but 
if you're if what you're doing is unclear to the audience if what you're doing is uh something that they dislike maybe it's because you're not being clear or maybe it's because you really don't know what would make you laugh if you saw someone else do it like watching the ollie ding johnson sketch that we were just doing it made me laugh so hard and it made me really happy so i was like that's a good sketch i like that sketch it's making me laugh 10 years later uh even though we wrote it but like it was it was exactly the sense of humor i would want um but there are certainly times where I've written sketches that were not very good, and I was really enamored of them, but someone might say, you know, that wasn't good and it didn't make sense, and it's worth thinking about, how can I make this make sense? Great, great advice. What, Michael? Focus on your health. <laughs> Focus on your mental attitude. As your, as your mind ain't doing right, you know, think, you can't think your way out of your mind not being right, usually. Nine times out of ten, you got to do something physical, mm -hmm. go do an exercise, yep. change, change your eating habits. Yep. Don't just eat junk food all day. Right. And That's learn what point. is junk food and what ain't junk food. Mm hmm. That's a really good point. I was actually thinking about how I want to mention this today, now that we're talking about serious stuff. All the people who wanted serious stuff left because they had to deal with 45 minutes of jokes. So now the people who wanted jokes who've stuck around, we're going to give you really serious, boring stuff. Um, I was thinking about the fact that uh, the most important thing that I do for my life coach clients and that I do for myself is find externally imposed structure. So when you're in school it's there naturally and this is why a lot of autistic people do really badly after they graduate because they don't have the structure anymore if they don't have a job or they don't have uh an additional school they go to and you're doing so good i ain't never graduated <laughs> uh exactly uh but yeah so like getting externally imposed structure where you have something that's forcing you to wake up every day uh Ideally, something you like doing. So this doesn't work if you hate your job. But I love all four of my jobs. And so I'm really grateful that I have the externally imposed structure that doesn't let me follow my basic instinct of staying up till six in the morning reading Wikipedia uh, or whatever it is. You know, it forces me to structure my day. And that's really, really important. As New Michael was saying, you can't argue your brain out of not working right. But if you change your environment and your situation it will help but that being said you can practice the power of discipline and control of the will and i think that's a beautiful thing is underrated that's important too we have a question from somebody uh what have you taught each other during your time together as a troop well i couldn't read before we started hey. still can't I think we've taught each other that um, our, that, um, that friends, um, having friends, uh, and uh, and missing them is generally something that can be overcome. Uh, remember the time at one time in our first floor halfway through. I think Noah was at a wedding, and the three of us were were at a different place. And he texted me um, saying, I miss "You guys on Facebook." And so I decided I can fix this problem. So I. Um, so I texted him an entire Wikipedia article, and um, it, uh, I think it deactivated or made functionally, the phone was functionally uh, not responsive for a while, and it kept receiving me half and nine text. And uh, he said that solved the problem, he no longer missed it. Right. Remember, it's better. If you long for something, you can be cured by making that thing repulsive. That's a good point. So I learned that uh, you know, some people just can't be fixed. <laughs> Ricky with this. So I, I have another question for you. What was the most important thing your parents did to facilitate your independence and support your career path and choices? Conceiving me. Without that, I'd be nothing. Thank you, mom and dad. I know you're watching. Oh, speaking of mom and dad, I just got a, I just got a question from my mom. It's uh, uh, kind of hard to hear you guys on the couch. Yeah. Get off the couch, stupid! I'm <laughs> ending <laughs> the wall. Get off the couch. <laughs> yeah. I, I, my recommendation to mom is, is 
Sit so closer wait. to the computer so it can <laughs> It's true. You guys are breaking up because you're at a distance, but you know, we broke up before. We can do it again. No, we already disbanded. It's true. Uh, what was the question? So, another question How do you handle nerves or stage fright? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, for a little bit in our early career, uh, we would get nervous beforehand. But one of the nice things about being autistic is uh, what happens out here isn't real. So if in your head you're doing everything properly, you're not nervous anymore. It's just if you're like, oh, I can't remember that line or I can't remember that beat or I don't know if I like this line or I don't remember if I like this action or something, that makes you nervous. But the whole audience, you know, it's just a wall of... Uh, positive reinforcement that uh don't exist which is great in contrast to like 200 people who are individually judging me which is horribly overwhelming and you know you can't tolerate association that's how you do it you know yeah learn in the 70s it applies today like everything else <laughs> the association were around in the 60s i think they did windy no, i said dissociation you got to dissociate yourself you can't really you know survive out there Mm -hmm. So many people lose limbs, lose fingers, all that kind of stuff. It's a sad sawmill fact. Um, what you think about it is sad, and you're not dissociating right. Right. But yeah, yeah. stage, st sorry, stage fright. Right. Now go ahead, Jack. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say to add to that. Um, um, the fact that um, in, in many ways it's easier for at least, I think for most of us, if not all of us, in the past, it's been easier. In some ways, to perform to a group rather than a person, because you can't conceptualize every individual person out there. It's just like Noah said, mm -hmm. it's a wall of faces, and so I can actually, you know, I used to have pretty bad bad anxiety when talking to people, um, but it was a lot easier facing audience because you're not focusing on individual individual people, person, because you can't. So in a way, I think it helped me become more confident um, talking to individual people because getting all, I was getting this practice performing for all. Bunch of, or a bunch of people who I couldn't even conceptualize as real people. There's there were too many of those. Mm -hmm. I, well, two things. First of all, stage flight, what kind of dummies are afraid of a flaw? <laughs> but but Wait. apart from that, it's like... Are I, you talking I, about this dummy? I kind of agree. That's pretty funny. Man. I kind of agree with uh, my friend Jackie says, but for different reasons. You know, I think a, an audience is easier than an individual... Uh, not for conceptual reasons, but just maths, you know, just basic, uh, you know, what you're doing is never going to appeal to everybody, but you have a whole group of people to, you know, that you can get feedback from. So if somebody's not doing something or whatever, you can interact with that one person or, you know, if, if there's a couple of people there really laughing hard, it makes a huge difference if it's bombing even for like 80%. So that, that's why it crowds better because it's just statistics. Yeah, and like in most situations, there's exception to this rule. But in most situations, it's more helpful. It, it's more helpful to have somebody like you and what you do than it is unhelpful to have someone dislike you and what you do. Because you know, if someone sees your show, most of the time you're just going to be like, okay, I don't really care about this, and you don't haven't really lost much. But if someone likes you, then you know you might have made a long time fan. You might have made a friend even. Um, or fifteen dollars. Exactly. Yeah. At, 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 even better. <laughs> what a, oh sorry um go ahead I, I didn't mean to interrupt you i thought you were done okay so what advice do you have for autistic youth who are struggling to figure out their path in life get a map <laughs> i don't think any of us can improve on that <laughs> I use a search engine, use Google. <laughs> I was wrong. He did improve on it. <laughs> I think uh, that's a really hard question. Um, I'll give a I'll give a real answer. Um, I think I might have a real answer too if you're still thinking. Go ahead. Uh, it's it depending on how young you are. Don't get caught up with thinking you know your life has to follow a specific path and you have to have 
uh, you know, 100 steps all laid out because it may seem that people plan things and, and you may be a very smart person with a very large brain able to make sophisticated plans, but in reality, you kind of got to roll the punches and, and you can have a, a sort of a direction you're going, but uh, if, you, if you need to have an entire plan thing perfectly, 10 steps, 100 steps, whatever it is, how many years, well, that's nobody... Ain't nobody can do that because you don't know what the future is going to bring. You don't know how you're going to change. To so have a general strategy, maybe a general direction, and figure it out. Gain skills, have a positive attitude, network, find what you like to do. Yeah. You know, that's find what you like to do and find people who have done it before. Find what you like to do that's valuable to other people. Don't be don't be stupid. <laughs> All right. You know, it don't, don't matter how much you like something if it's not valuable to somebody else. We just mm-hmm. open it. Mm-hmm. That's a good yeah, point. I like having a lot of sawdust free lung. But I have to have to <laughs> yeah, I want to second what New Michael's saying. If just think about... You can do something I do a lot with, with clients who are young and don't know what they want to do for a living, which is look at the list of jobs on Craigslist. They have categories or on something and be like, okay, what of these fields interests me? Okay, this field is interesting. Like I wanna be a TV editor or something. Now you can click on that and figure out how many jobs there are on there. Probably not many, but now you look up who is a TV editor who's making money? How did they get there? Did they need to go to school for it or not? And if not, how did they get the qualifications necessary? And then really work backwards of how can I become this thing that I want to be that said not everyone can do this and if you can't you know know, not all society's rules are important some of them are so Mm -hmm. it's all about figure out which ones are important and which ones aren't and in what situations they're important and which ones they're not and you know it's difficult you know that's really good advice too you know, like eye contact is necessary during job interviews. And if the police stop you, that's about it. Uh, oh, you don't need to it. force it the rest of the time if it's unpleasant for you. And similarly, there's, you know, my hair is messy a lot of the time, but I look okay despite it. So I don't care unless I'm at a job interview or something like that. And in those cases, yeah, you do need to listen to what other people are telling you. Even if you hate it, even if it feels wrong and weird, you do need to pay attention. But a lot of the time you can just be yourself and be cool and your coolness and your lack of concern for the societal norms will supersede the fact that you're not following things in this sort of irrelevant way and you can become really, really cool. But it's a risk. And I want to explain too on the positivity aspect that um, Michael Noah have already mentioned. It's not just, it's not just part of it is that at People on the spectrum can, can get overwhelmed pretty easily, so it's important to avoid that trap by continually reminding yourself of the, of the positive. Mm-hmm. Practicing a you know ethical thankfulness is really important. I think mm-hmm. be thankful for what you have rather than you know uh, focusing on what you lack. But also just um, there's a lot a practical benefit to, to assuming that things will work out in a general sense, and I don't mean that uh, I don't mean just be naively assume everything will work out and not do anything. But to a certain extent, it's better, um, you're much better off. Um, I mean, if people, if people see you as, as confident and happy, then you're more likely to actually succeed. I mean, it's a self-reinforcing feedback loop. Um, you're less likely to get stuck in, um, in your negative emotions, and you're more likely to be liked by people. I actually have a magic, there's actually kind of like a magic word to me. I'm not to be overwhelmed, actually. You know, a lot of people think I'm joking when I say it. And partly it's true, but there's actually the magic words. I first learned it when I was being trained at the sawmill. The magic words no, are, don't say the magic words. The magic words are, it's really simple. And people think I'm joking when I say it, but actually when I'm overwhelmed by something or whatever, if I just say it's really simple, actually by affirming it, it almost makes it come true because immediately all the variables collapse in my brain into only what the most important ones are. So if you just practice that kind of thing, maybe it'll work for you too, maybe it won't, but just say, hey, it's really simple. And then you start 
not being overwhelmed by irrelevant stuff that don't matter. Mm -hmm. It is really important to be confident and decide I'm going to succeed at this as opposed to, you know, I can't or I'm overwhelmed by uncertainty or I don't understand any of the many things that the world is asking of me and so I don't know what to do because no one respects an anxious person who's uncertain of themselves. It's just not, not impressive. But you can be overconfident and decide that everything you do is perfect, which is also foolish. So in an ideal world, we can look at ourselves as we really are and see what our potential is and follow that and not beat ourselves up because we haven't achieved it yet. Well, this is I do the beat. <laughs> this is something that I've had on my wall for about 10 years that uh, I used to need, but I don't need anymore um, because I just do this naturally. But it's letters in you now. What, Ethan? Well, that used to be part of a uh, an envelope. It was part of an envelope. Always reuse things. There's no reason for you to buy blank paper when people mail you trash all the time. But uh, I do all these things every day, and it really, really helps. Uh, you know, if you don't get sunlight on your skin, if you don't exercise, you will feel worse. And it's it's basic science, but. I know your impulse is to sit there reading Wikipedia for 15 hours straight or whatever it is, or playing video games all day. I don't let myself play video games because I know I will never stop. Uh, and so this, this sort of structure helps me, helps me stay productive and have four jobs. I see. Do you spend any time watching your own documentaries? Uh, we, we watched the premiere. Um, and, uh, I don't think I don't think we've seen it since, right? No. Oh, I don't consider it my documentary because first of all, I didn't make the thing. If I made the thing, it'd be a thousand times different. Mm -hmm. What you gotta understand is that anybody who makes a movie gets to like, basically say whatever they want is true because it's how they you know put the sequencing and they what clips they choose. Everybody knows that. But then apart from that, it's so different. If I ever see the thing, it's like watching a different guy. Basically, I don't see that the same guy as me. Well, I agree. You weren't even in the movie. There was this young guy named New Michael in the movie. He didn't have an orange hat. Yeah, it's not really our movie. It's just a movie some person made about, about us. Yeah. But it, it sounds slightly more important to say our movie than a um, movie somebody else made about us. So I didn't right. tend to say that, even though it's, it's, it's why. Yeah, Think of it as fan. As best as they, are, they, they can be for you, and that can change during the situation. It doesn't matter. So if it makes it look better to call it your movie, call it your movie. Mm -hmm. That's my advice to anybody who's in a movie. Think of it as fan fiction. That's what any documentary is. We actually write our own fan fiction. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot that goes on in those stories. Some of it some of us wish was real. <laughs> it's true. We had a, I'll tell you all a fun story. Um, for about, I don't know, six months or something, we had an Excel spreadsheet that we shared, just the four of us, that no one else ever saw. It was just a schedule for keeping watch. And uh, it was every day broken up into six hour um, shifts and then each of our names for each shift. And uh, this didn't refer to anything. This was just a schedule we created to keep watch. And so to this day, we will be like, Ethan, why weren't you keeping watch last night? As if this was a, a actual job we had. And that's the sort of fan fiction that we do actually make for ourselves. It makes me laugh when I remember that. That was fun. I like that the more launchy stuff is the fact <laughs> I know. I think you can watch as funny around to Yeah, it is. Well, it depends on what you're watching, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you keep watching, eventually something around will happen. No, that's a fallacy. That's just <laughs> people who say that, like, uh, you know, pie includes every combination of everything. It's because it's infinite. It doesn't mean it has everything. I only say fallacy on three. Can we mute them? <laughs> <laughs> Powers of the sky. So I have another question from the audience. Uh, how did you get involved with Netflix and HBO? How did those 
docu-series, uh, documentary come about? Well, in 2005, I found myself really bored. I was unemployed. So I was like, you know, I kind of want to just watch DVDs all day. So I got a Netflix account. They started mailing me West Wing every few days. I'd watch it all day, every day. I was a big loser. I didn't go anywhere or see anybody. I was just addicted to watching TV. And then I became very depressed and realized this is horrible and is making me suicidal. And then I got the job working at the camp where I met these guys and learned I'm not allowed to watch TV except during meals or with other people. And that's how I got out of Netflix until they made our movie. If anybody out there is ambitious and want to be in show business, the way you do it is make sure you log on to Netflix on a computer that's on a webcam. And basically, they screen all those. So if you're doing your impression of what you see on what's going on on the Netflix, if you're doing your impression of it in front of a webcam, they actually see that and they will contact you. So just support a lot relentlessly. You have a positive attitude, and eventually it'll happen. You get a what were what were you watching that you did an impression of where they decided to let you on? Uh, I don't want to admit what it was. Okay. I get myself in trouble. Was it the Asperger's or Us documentary? Because that's how I got on. I think it was Gilmore Girls. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> You're really bad at doing an impression of them, Jack. <laughs> I'm surprised Netflix took you. I mean, the real answer to this question, because people are always like, I want to be on TV, and like, someone has to contact you who's in the film industry and then make a movie about you. Uh, people are so dumb, they think it's important. We think we're important just because we were on Netflix. <laughs> but like any any guy can get online, you put a camera in front of him, <laughs> and, and you get online just because you put the Netflix thing on it. People think it's important. <laughs> the thing is, a lot more people on, around, the, around the planet watch YouTube than Netflix. So if you can just get a webcam and upload something to YouTube, you're on a bigger platform than Netflix. I mean, we're on YouTube. That's the thing you haven't mentioned yet. We're on YouTube? We're, we've we're been on YouTube for... We've been on yeah. YouTube for some time. Well, actually, that was because we auditioned. No, it works the same way as Netflix. You can see our impressions. We are no, no, no. You're, you're auditioning. There's a really lengthy process to get on YouTube. It's like yeah. America's Got Talent. We did our impression of the hydraulic press. <laughs> Even with the press. That got squeezed. <laughs> Impressing? Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Alex Lehman made our movie and our TV show, and Mark Duplass helped him uh, edit and sell it to those channels, and we're very grateful to them for those things. We're just filled with gratitude. We're so full of gratitude, we might burst. <laughs> Watch out. So, well, what plans do you have going forward during the pandemic uh, as we hopefully come toward the end of the pandemic, but in the meantime, what are you going to be doing? Will you be doing virtual shows or putting things on YouTube or what kinds of plans do you have? You know, it's not actually all that important to use shampoo. As long as you use conditioner, you'll be okay. <laughs> we can see. That's why you're wearing that orange hat. It's kind of like a scam almost. <laughs> More like scam food, am I right? How is it how is it beneficial to you? Because you're using just as much conditioner as you would shampoo. What's the... Because they say use both. Oh, I always just use a combination. Shampoo, conditioner, soap, toothpaste, protein bar. It's not a very well-known product. A detailed regimen. I mean, it's great. I don't buy literally anything else ever. I save a lot of money. It's it's easy. Uh, no. Food group right there. Yep. All four food groups. Because it don't come out straight enough to be a pyramid. It's like a food plot pie. <laughs> it's not a pyramid. That's true. A food block. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Our our plans are uh, maybe if the pandemic ends in time, we will do a show this year. That's. Otherwise, if anybody wants to hire us to do digital shows, we, we, we can. I'm looking to get a camera. Does anybody have advice that I go with Nikon, that I go with Canon, another brand, mirrorless, of course. 
I had a Nikon Z50, a good entry level model, but I'd like to buy a camera of my own. I think Nike makes good cameras. Nikon? No, Nike. Nike? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard it, I, I've heard it argue both ways. Nike, Nike cameras. Are... I can show you after this call. Okay. I'm going to keep working, uh, teaching clients, teaching and, and working with clients online. I'm really lucky I get to stay home and do my job. I basically never leave. I wanted to say thank you very much for having us here. It's great to be here in my house where I spend 98% of my time. That's off to you guys. <laughs> oh, balls! Hey! Hey, ball head! <laughs> it's amazing. Before before this Zoom started, you had a full head of hair. It was quickly. It was orange. Anything else? So, well. Yeah, any, any last comments you have before Keep we wrap up? Smile, okay, be happy, be positive. You're like my buddy Frank, who lost his finger, but he still lives a happy, fulfilling life. <laughs> a great family. Um, I think uh, I want to say I'm really grateful to all of our fans. Uh, you've given us the chance to do really cool stuff, and... Uh, we hope that we uh, can continue to be funny in the future. And if anybody wants to uh, hire us to do a special, uh, hit us up. Regular, you know, either one. Yeah, exactly. Hire us to do a one hour normal. Well, better yet, listen to all your favorite songs on YouTube and have a good, good evening. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Noah, New Michael, Ethan, and Jack for being here with us today and sharing your incredible journey with us. We appreciated this opportunity to learn more about your work and get to know you more. We hope this event has also been an inspiration to others who might be considering career in the entertainment industry or simply pioneering uncharted territory. How can our audience find out more about Asperger's or us? Well, there ain't no such thing as uncharted territory anymore since they got satellite dishes up there, but <laughs> You're forgetting the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Earth's mantle. There's plenty of unfair territory in there. And you don't know nothing. You forgot to thank Hubert, who I think really deserves credit for giving me all of the answers to all of my questions. Um, uh, yeah, AspergersRS.com. And uh, if you... Yeah, Facebook, Asperger's Arrest. That's, that's got some good stuff. Oh, and shout out to Jack, who's going to be a grown-up soon. Oh yeah, I'll it'll, I'll be uh, I'll be 28 soon. The um uh, the, the year it, people finally become adults. Yeah, we'll we'll post on Facebook just for that, and then not again for six months. Okay, uh, becoming an adult something you learn, not something that happens. <laughs> that sounds excellent. Well, thank you again thank you. to our listening for being here, and thank you to our guests for your time. We really appreciated having you here with us today. For those of you who are interested, please tune in for our upcoming special event on April 28th on the federal response to address the needs of people on the autism spectrum during the coronavirus pandemic. We will be, we have posted information about this on the IACC website at iacc.hhs.gov. So thank you again and goodbye. Forever. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. You were great. You were yeah, great. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Susan. That was awesome. I forgot to thank you on air. <laughs>